Guided by a friend's recommendation, I bought Sleeping Dogs on Steam for like 5 bucks. And after 30 hours and essentially platinuming the game, I say essentially because fuck these things, I realized something. Man, I really used to like open world crime games as a kid, didn't I? Even, or maybe especially, the smaller, less budgetary ambitious ones. The ones that didn't make you a spawn of the god of destruction rampaging in a mayhem through a sandbox full of very delicate porcelain dolls like the GTA series did. And don't get me wrong, I love all the Grand Theft Autos that came out on PS2, and it's their sheer quality and popularity that made these other games possible. But it's the titles like The Godfather, The Getaway or Mafia that I remembered more fondly. Games in which the relatively small, open cityscape grounded the story and gave it a sense of intimacy that just a straight mission-to-mission -mission structure would not. The first Mafia, especially, is a game that I replayed over and over as I was deeply in love with these polygonal parodies of human beings and the relatively low-stakes personal drama that took me all over the city of Lost Heaven. And Sleeping Dogs, made by United Front Studios, is very much a game in the same vein. Originally envisioned as a third installment in a true crime series that focuses on ex-con police officers in the middle of the criminal underbelly, the tale centers around Wei Shen, an undercover cop tasked with infiltrating the Hong Kong triad known as Sun On Yi and making a case that could take down the higher-ups of this organization. As it tends to be with these stories, loyalties get conflicted, lines between right and wrong get blurred, and the blood is spilled. But before we get to that, let's talk about the gameplay. This is, after all, a video game. I think Sleeping Dogs is a very, very happy midpoint between GTA and the Yakuza series. The virtual Hong Kong is much more compact than, say, Liberty City, but it's certainly not a single city block like Kamurocho. You can get into illegal street races, but also sing karaoke. <laughs> You can play dress up and collect vehicles that you have to pay for and not just steal and stash in the garage, or you can just play ma- Wait, this isn't mahjong? What the fuck even is this? Why only pinfu tiles? Why are there more than four of each kind? I can feel my soul being ripped in half. Save me, Ichihime! Ah, much better. You do drive around and sometimes shoot guns at people, especially towards the tail end of the story, but the combat primarily focuses on melee, as Shen is a practitioner of Kung Fu. There is even an entire collectible side quest focused on unlocking new melee moves, and a DLC side story that is THE most shameless rip of adventure the dragon to ever exist. And I love it! Speaking of DLC, all of them are included with a definitive edition. I would say play all the ones that are integrated into the main campaign and Nightmare at North Point. It's a fun, two-hour cheap horror pastiche where you primarily fight Jiangxi, you know, the Chinese hopping vampires. It's like American Nightmare for Red Dead Redemption, only much shorter and on a lower budget. The other separate campaign DLC, Year of the Snake, is not very good. It includes good stuff in the main campaign in the form of police jobs, but the story itself feels tacked on and hollow, like they made it as an afterthought to all the mechanics they made for cop working. As you do story missions, you get two kinds of experience, police and triad. This isn't some conflicting loyalty meter like in, say, Splinter Cell Double Agent, but just two different resources for two different upgrade trees. Triad XP is gained by essentially being a John Woo movie protagonist. The more stylishly you put people through a lot of pain, the more you get. Powering attacks, lining up headshots and exploding the vehicles of the opposing tribe members, even if they get out of them and don't use them anymore, builds up your legend in the underworld and gives you access to even more ruthless combat maneuvers. Police XP is a bit different. You always start missions with a full bar, but you lose it if you cause collateral damage, hurting civilians, destroying property, stealing cars, that sort of stuff. 
These points in turn give you access to tech, like a stick that lets you break into cars without the alarm turning on, or abilities like disarming fucks with guns. It might seem like Triad XP is easier to get than the police one, but not really. Criminal experience, a bit counterintuitively, needs you to stay in combat for longer and not use insta-kill environmental attacks too early as to not lose potential points. Police XP, in turn, can be earned in droves by doing side quests where you get back in uniform and do stuff like pacifying armed robbers or de-escalating a hostage situation. They are so numerous that you can get all police skills no problem, even if you drive like a drunkard in the main story. That said, tying the notion of being an undercover cop to your progression is a pretty clever way of making you act the role. Writing on Games did a great video on that topic, check it out. When fighting in melee, you can grab an enemy and perform environmental instant kills, sorta like Yakuza hit actions, but without a bar to manage. They get increasingly brutal as the game goes on, which is a nice little piece of Luna narrative, portraying how far gone the protagonist gets and how he's willing to watch it all burn. You start off throwing people into cardboards full of glass and wasting, eh, he'll live, to stuff that is definitely lethal. Like, Jesus Christ, Officer Shen, that's the definition of out of line. As expected from a GTA clone, the in-game radio stations are full of fantastic music that I can't play here as I don't want YouTube copyright algorithms tearing me a new one. Suffice to say, I now have a newfound appreciation for Hong Kong rap. Movement is done in a pretty standard Assassin's creed -y kind of way, with Shen parkouring all over the place. The fun thing is that you don't just need to hold the button, but also time your presses. Otherwise, HKPD's finest stumbles, lands badly or just slumps against a low wall. So that keeps things engaging. If there is one unbeatable enemy in this game, it's realism. Not in the sense that one bullet kills you or whatever, but because Hong Kong uses left side traffic rules. Okay, so I need to turn right here and... Sorry, I'm sorry sir, I grew up in America, please understand. The setting is what truly makes the game unique in my eyes. While the gameplay conventions might feel familiar, setting the game in HK and having an almost fully Asian cast really makes it stand out from the rest of its skin. And speaking of the cast of the characters, I love one thing about them as a collective. They are treated seriously. Let's take Winston as an example. The first guy that Wei has to work for when infiltrating the triad, Winston is not a smart boy. He's emotional, rash and does way too many steroids. But he's also fiercely loyal and gets a somber moment or two. In another, lesser, game, we got the same archetype in Brucey, who can't shut the fuck up about how manly he is as he does push-ups. This man couldn't manage McDonald's, but he's somehow deep in with the criminal activities of Liberty City. Come on. Don't try to pull a serious, sad story on me towards the finale when I despise every single person I meet in the world you created. Sleeping Dogs might be just as cliché and rip off a ton of crime movies, but the sincerity given to the actions of the characters makes it stand on its own. Like, man, I would watch this if this was a film, no joke. Speaking of cinema, Sleeping Dogs is quite clearly influenced by Hong Kong blood operas like the movies of John Woo and later, less action-packed films from that city that focus on the criminal underside of the autonomous region. I have to admit, I'm no cinephile. I watch maybe a couple of movies a year and still haven't seen some cultural touchstones like, say, anything from the MCU. So, as a complete outsider, I got in. Deep undercover. I binged all the movies I was recommended by a list I found online, as well as by some friends. I am one of them now. I have been touched by the darkness of organized crime and can never, ever come back. And I do not regret one bit, this movie's fucking slap! List of recommendations in the description. So you know what? Rather than spoil you the plot of Sleeping Dogs by describing events in the game or what movies they reference, let's talk about the soul that connects them. The black, rotten heart animating all these stories. Let's talk about the Chinese triads. There's also tongues, but we'll not get into them here, as they're mostly US-based. Question! What is a triad? A really big gang from China? Yes! But actually no, it's complicated. The triads are undeniably involved with criminal activity in the contemporary days, such as gambling, drugs and human trafficking, but they trace their roots to a secret society formed in the 1760s that aimed to topple the then-ruling Qing dynasty and restore the rightful rule of the Ming dynasty. 
The group called the Tian Di Hui, or Hongmen, has been likened to the European Freemasons due to their secrecy and influence that reached well outside their country of origin. The Qing dynasty lost power in 1911, in part due to their efforts, but there was no longer any Ming dynasty to restore. The organization was split into the group located in mainland China that already dabbled in criminal activities to sustain itself in the 19th century, most notably opium smuggling, and all the overseas branches. The latter still exist today and several prominent politicians like one president of Taiwan being members. Oh yeah, and they are also the only party other than the communist one present in the People's Republic of China's government. So, you know, pretty influential, kind of a big deal. The former mainland group became the progenitor of the contemporary triads, criminal organizations with incredibly long lineage. Repressed by Mao Zedong after the Communist Revolution, they mostly moved business to Hong Kong and Taiwan, as well as many other overseas countries. Why am I taking you through this history lesson, dear viewer? Well, three reasons. For one, to show you even a glimpse of what an insane foothold the triads as a concept have in the consciousness of people living there. They have been around for longer than any of the governments present there. If you grew up poor or disenfranchised or just went to a school that didn't have walls and a gate, I'm pretty sure that you knew a kid that wanted to be a gangster. Hell, maybe that was you. But did that kid ever say, yeah, when I grew up I want to be a part of this very specific group? Because that's totally what happens in Hong Kong. The Sunny On Triad, and yes, Sleeping Dogs did just swap two words to make their fictional triad, has been around since 1919. Imagine growing up in squalor and learning that you can be a part of the rich, powerful group that has been around for a century, that even your grandparents remember from their childhoods. That's these kids' version of becoming a doctor or a lawyer with the same amount of social respect gained, if not even more. The second reason is the quorum. Even if the organization lost its original purpose, having 200 years of history as a secret brotherhood gives the triads a lot of legitimacy. Traditions, laws, rituals, hierarchy and symbolism all help legitimize the triads as not just gangs, but organizations on par with the police, government or even religious cults. Even just by looking at the structure used by the triads in general, we can get a glimpse at what a well-oiled machine that is. Aside from the boss of it all, or a dragon head, you have red poles acting as generals for gangs, white paper fans being advisors and administrators, and straw sandals acting as general organizers, fixers and whatnot. It's not just an army-like structure of lieutenants and majors, the structure of a triad makes it an entire country in itself. That notion in particular is what makes organized crime organizations like the Triad or the Sicilian Cosa Nostra particularly persistent as a threat. Like, sure, you may call protection money rackets or extortion, but it might just as well be called taxes. If you live in a region that the police don't care about or don't move into, is it a really a wrong call to pay some money to criminals to stop others from giving you trouble? Of course, it's more complex than just governmental negligence, as the criminal organizations are more than likely to act in any way they can to preserve that kind of status quo to keep their profits. But for a common vendor selling pork buns, what difference does it make which feudal lord they pay their taxes to? The third reason is that the trappings of a brotherhood bled over from the secret society to the triads. Members of the organization are sworn to each other by blood to never betray their brothers and help each other when it be. It extends to your closest circle more than the organization in general, so infighting is not uncommon, but betrayal is seen as an offense so great that the punishment for it is not just death, but death caused by a thousand cats. Let's just say Sleeping Dogs gets very creative with that one. The seriousness of how these bonds are treated extends even to the religious sphere. Guan Yu was a human general from the era of Three Kingdoms who was so good at his job that he was deified. As a patron of warriors and the bond of brotherhood, he's of course worshipped by the triads as well as by the police. Seriously, the shrine to Guan Yu can be found inside most police stations in Greater China. And, as a fun little detail, Wei Shen sports a tattoo of Guan Yu, seemingly showing that he's permanently stuck in both of these worlds. This kind of intimacy is probably the primary reason why tales of triad members are so popular in Hong Kong cinema. Rather than deal with this big, powerful organization at the top level like, say, The Godfather does, it's much more focused on the bonds between members on an individual level. The organization is so big and seemingly ancient that any story about taking down the whole thing probably seems like a gross, naive oversimplification of the influence it has. 
Therefore, the movies and indeed Sleeping Dogs focus more on the personal struggles of people within that structure. While the plot does eventually reach top-level triad power plays, it feels like a backdrop to Wei's personal struggle of conflicting loyalties and the ever-growing amount of blood on his hands. Because the game is based on a real place that has a real crime problem with real seemingly ancient criminal organizations, Sleeping Dogs feels like it has some weight behind its story. It's not some writer's idea of what the criminal underbelly of Hong Kong might be like. They have clearly done their research to the point where both triads present in the story are thinly veiled copies of real-life organizations. Even if they're cliché by crime story standards, Weishin's undercover hijinks feel much more grounded and sincere than, say, Nicobelic working for 50 different criminal organizations in an escalating order. It narrows the cast of characters down and gives each of them a time to shine and be presented to the player, very much like Hong Kong blood operas tend to have like five named characters tops. And just like in those movies, that grounding doesn't feel undermined by how you flip over cover in slow motion or shoot the tires out of a hundred vehicles in every car chase. So yeah, if you like that kind of cinema, I do recommend giving Sleeping Dogs a try. It's cheap and short, so this won't be a major investment for you either way. And if, like me, you have never touched a single movie from Hong Kong before, give the game a try too! If the vibe resonates with you, you'll find several decades of other great media waiting for you. And holy shit, Infernal Affairs is so good! I'll try to fit another video before the year ends. If I don't manage to do it, hey, Merry Christmas! This video was made possible by coffee donations from the following wonderful people. Kwadracik. JC and Ronvald. I'm gonna go Google a recipe for pork buns now. See you later.